Welcome to the Data Company Podcast. My name is Jedediah Yu, and I'm the founder and CEO of Delphix and the author of Disrupt or Die. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Gene Kim. Gene's widely known as the, the head cheerleader of the DevOps movement. His novel, The Phoenix Project, helped catalyze the entire movement. He's an award-winning CTO and the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of a new book, The Unicorn Project. So welcome to the podcast, Gene. Jed, so great to be talking to you again and delighted to be on. Gene, tell us a little bit about your own transformation, how you went from a founder and CTO into an award-winning author and cheerleading and spearheading this DevOps movement. <laughs> yeah, so I've been studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999, and that's a journey that started back when I was the CTO and founder of a company called Tripwire in the information security space. And so these high performers, you know, those were the organizations that have simultaneously had the best project due date performance in development, the best operational stability, and the best posture, security, and compliance. And uh, we just want to understand how did they make their good to create transformation so that other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. And so, you know, the biggest surprise in that 21-year journey is really how DevOps is not being used by the tech giants, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, but really by uh, the large complex organizations, you know, the largest and most well-known brands across every industry vertical. And I just have no doubt uh, that when those organizations um, of where 18 million developers reside are as productive as those in the tech giants, you know, they that will create trillions of dollars of economic value per year. Um, and, and so uh, that's why I'm, I'm so excited to seeing how all those practices are really being adopted, not just to uh, survive in the marketplace, but also win in the marketplace. I absolutely agree. And it's critical that we have diverse, strong businesses across all industries, not just the tech giants. So <laughs> That's right. It's a really great mission. You, you said something pretty interesting there. You said that in, in high performing organizations, they not only have high speed, they also have high quality and high security simultaneously. But most of the time, people would think those are trade offs. Now, how do you get all three together? You know, one of the most astounding findings uh, in the state of DevOps research, which I did with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble, uh, you know, that's a cross-population study of 36,000 respondents uh, that spanned over six years. And for six years in a row, it has been decisive that uh, you can be more agile and be more reliable at the same time. They deploy more frequently. Uh, they take, uh, they can deploy quicker. <laughs> they have better uh, deployment outcomes and they have better mean time to prepare when things go wrong. So it just says that the only way to get real reliability is to do smaller deployments more frequently, which also results when you integrate information security objectives into everyone's daily work, you end up with better security outcomes. And by the way, that also correlates with uh, better organizational performance that, um, they are more likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. <laughs> They're better able to achieve mission and organization goals, regardless of how they define define it, whether it's quality, quantity, or uh, customer satisfaction. Now, in both the Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project, these are really bottom-up transformation movements, right? They're people who are in the trenches, in technology, in operations that are driving the changes, and the CEOs of these fictional companies are pretty disconnected. How much do you see bottom-up versus top-down innovation driving change? Yeah, I think they all must start bottom-up. The sweet spot still is, I think, a third or fourth line manager. Often it is a director of development or a director of operations presenting. And I think that's where typically these initiatives start. Um, and I think it's because that it's at that director level where they're close enough to the work where they can see kind of like, horrendous things that shouldn't be happening, right? <laughs> and they have a notion of, you know, there must be a better way to do things, but they're also senior enough to uh, see the business perspective and can make that uh, judgment about where is a good place to start <laughs> and how do I hide enough capacity to take a risk and try doing things in a new way and are savvy enough to be able to promote that within the organization. At some point, that track of success earns the right for top levels of leadership to say, this is something that's strategic. Uh, it's not something that we need to bring a whole bunch of consultants in. We actually have internal expertise and their job becomes to accelerate that, to remove obstacles, to, to truly enable those transformations to, um, uh, you know, accelerate as best, uh, as much as it can. It makes sense that they have to be close enough to see the problem, but in contrast in Silicon Valley, it's often product CEOs who start these companies. They start at the top. So contrast, contrast what's happening in the world of Silicon Valley and tech giants to, to these kind of mid-level bottom-up movements that you're seeing in big enterprises. Oh, that's a great now. point. It is not 
usual <laughs> for uh, the top ranks of leadership to come from a technology background. So uh, I think th that is a, a fundamental handicap of these traditional enterprises in these other industry verticals. Uh, but I, I think that is changing. I mean, I think one of my favorite presentations from the uh, Vegas Virtual Summit was uh, from Vernon Lutz, an EVP, um, formerly EVP of Transformation, um, who really noted, you know, as he said, uh, the absence of technology talent at that top table, right? They came from finance, banking, law, <laughs> right? But but not technology. And he said that that is changing. Uh, they brought in a uh, their chief architect, SVP and chief architect is uh, Ian Eslick. Uh, they hired him from Amazon, <laughs> right? To, to really bring that technology sensibility. So I, I think you're absolutely right. By the way, Chad, when you bring this up, it reminds me of the the latest paper. Uh, one of the this showed up in the Harvard Business Review that came out of the Apple University program. And they said that one of the things that they look for in Apple is a leader who can work three levels down, <laughs> right? And I, so I, I think there is something even within the technology community, um, you know, required where these technology leaders have to have be sufficiently close to the work, right? And even being able to talk to someone right three levels down, which I think is uh, rare even even in Silicon Valley companies. When you look at the high performing organizations in the world compared to the, the average or, or maybe kind of the, the lower performing organizations, what's the divide in quality, secure output? Oh yeah, it, it's orders of magnitude. So uh, the high performers are deploying once a day, you know, multiple deployments per day versus uh, you know, perhaps monthly or quarterly deployments for the non-high performers. Uh, code deployment lead time is measured by how quickly can we go from a change put into version control through integration, through testing, through deployments, so customers get value one hour or less uh, versus, um, you know, days or potentially even weeks. And uh, they're seven times more likely to have those deployments succeed uh, without causing a seven outage, a service impairment, a security breach or a compliance failure. And when something goes wrong, uh, they can fix it in one hour or less uh, versus a day or more. And whenever you see these kind of stark differences, orders of magnitude differences between high and low, you know that there's something really magical happening. And uh, what's been amazing over the years is that, you know, the percentage of those organizations that are high performing keep growing. So uh, it just shows that uh, this is a uh, critical differentiator for success because it's no longer uh, the large, the, the big being small, <laughs> it's fast being the slow. And so the, probably the best of all worlds, right, is to be big and fast, right, <laughs> which crushes small and fast. Yeah, that, that was, that's definitely true. Now, in Accelerate, the book that you were referencing with the large study, you talk a lot about some of the critical elements to be a high-performing organization. And one of the things you talk about is, is version controlling everything. It's not just about the code. Now, tell me about that. In the uh, ideal, really, everything should be version control. Version control gives us safety, right? Is that uh, it gives us the ability to know what happened, to roll back, uh, to be able to fix forward confidently from a, some sort of established known state. And I think we're just now realizing to what extent we can do that with data. And I think one of the things that we try to explore in the Unicorn Project is uh, this bigger problem around data. Um, we now live in a world where 30 to 50% of uh, company employees use or manipulate data in their daily work. So that's arguably an even larger population than developers. As much value that DevOps has created, <laughs> uh, you know, I think the uh, the value that gets created when uh, we can truly use these same software development practices for data uh, will be uh, even larger. Even things when we choose like things like Kafka, right, for uh, event streaming, uh, you know, we, we seek to have some sort of immutable view of data that we can <laughs> replay time, right, that we know what happened as opposed to mutating data and state. Yeah, t tell me more about why is immutability important when it comes to releasing software and, and then how does that translate into, into the data space? For 20 years, I self-identified as an ops person, and that's really despite uh, getting my graduate degree in compiler design and high-speed networking uh, back in 1995. And it was always my observation that it was really operations where all the saves were made. It was ops who saved us from terrible developers who didn't care about quality and pushed into production anyway. <laughs> it was operations who protected our data and our applications because it certainly wasn't the terrible information security people. Um, but in the last four years, I've really changed my mind. I now no longer self-identify as a uh, as an ops person, but as a developer. And that was really from learning a uh, functional programming language called Clojure that runs on the JVM or transpiles into JavaScript. And it was the most 
challenging thing I've ever learned in my professional career, but it was also one of the most rewarding. One of the main things I learned was just the value of immutability. Functional programming languages like Clojure, um, it forces an immutable, uh, the immutability of variables. You end up with safe, a far safer world when you, you know, can never overwrite data in a database. I think we've all had experiences in our career where we wrote a query, wrote an answer statement, or of course, yeah, the delete statement <laughs> where we do terrible things to production data and we can't get it back. And, you know, uh, short of, you know, a multi-hour restore. Again, one of these statements I'll make with moral certainty, <laughs> right? Is that life is better when you have immutability, whether it's in code or in data. So Gene, you've been a great advisor and an investor in Delphix. We should disclose that to the audience. Tell, tell me a little bit about why you've invested and why you've been interested in advising Delphix. I think the aha moment for me was that uh, DevOps has, I think, transformed almost every aspect of um, technologies, whether it's uh, development, QA, operations. <laughs> and you know, it was such an eye opener to see what could be done in the database space as well. And there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, there are going to be equally dramatic changes happening uh, in the database portions, right? At the heart of every data center, whether it's uh, in the cloud or on premise, right, is typically a database. Uh, and so I'm just really excited to see all this innovation happening uh, at, for something so critical. Thank you so much for participating in the Data Company podcast. We learned an incredible amount today. The DevOps journey that you've helped with, you helped cheerlead and spearhead in the world has really been taking flight. It's incredible to see the success of all these great companies as they, as they move from lower performing development organizations to these high performing organizations that can challenge the, the tech giant. So thank you so much for participating and look forward to speaking with you again soon. Jed, always a pleasure. Congratulations on your successes. And I look forward to the next time we get to hang out together. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Gene.